Hello and welcome to another episode of the Family Renewal Podcast. And today I'm grateful to have a friend of mine who has uh, a similar kind of background as I do as a homeschooled graduate and now a homeschooling father. I'm talking with Ben Davis, who is a uh, senior marketing manager at BJU Press, which is one of the largest Christian curriculum publishers in the world. And uh, we're going to be talking today about the future careers of our children, which I know is a topic that all of us uh, think about to some extent and probably need to think about more, especially as they get to those tween and teen years. Um, ben has, uh, has been giving a lot of thought to this over time. And so, uh, first of all, I just want to welcome you to the show. Thanks for uh, joining us on the Family Renewal Podcast. Well, thank you, Israel. Really appreciate you having me and looking forward to discussing uh, this important topic with you. So uh, let's first of all, just allow you to introduce yourself and explain a little bit about your homeschooling background and then tell us about your family. Yeah, I was very privileged uh, to um, have a family that really wanted to make sure us, uh, the children in the family, learn uh, from a biblical worldview. Uh, my dad said, it's our responsibility to educate these children, and we can't let anybody else do it. And so uh, from kindergarten through 12th grade, that's uh, our experience. And uh, I know I put my mom through a lot of difficulty as a child, um, but today I really do rise up and call her blessed for her patience and uh, not, not giving up on me when I was being stubborn and trying to learn. Um, and really grateful for everything that my parents taught me. Uh, my wife is also a homeschool grad. Uh, she started uh, homeschooling when she was in fifth grade. And um, when we met, we knew we wanted to homeschool, but we, we kind of thought maybe it'll be okay to, to put the kids in a, um, a local uh, Christian school uh, that we had a lot of confidence in, and at least for the first couple of years. Um, and that's something, you know, the teachers were great, faculty is great, the school emphasis was great, uh, but we just found that the other children that were there were being a negative influence on them. So um, we, we started homeschooling at that point, and uh, it has made a tremendous difference um, in our family dynamics um, by having them at home. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to do exactly what my dad did, which is say, this is our responsibility, and we really shouldn't be giving it over to somebody else. So we, we're really thankful to have our this heritage and to be passing it on to our children. So how many children do you have? What are their, what are their age ranges? Yeah, we have a 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 4-year-old, and really thankful they're all girls uh, and really enjoy them. Uh, my 11-year-old my is a reader. We cannot get enough books for her. Um, she, if we've only been to the library twice in the week, she's a little disappointed. <laughs> our uh, our nine year old is a kinesthetic learner. She likes to move a lot, and uh, she's she's a real delight. She's she's somebody who likes to fiddle with things and do crafts and and to bake and uh, to to move around quite a bit. Our um, our seven year old and our four year old really like to play together. And our seven-year-old really just starting to see her come on as a reader too, uh, where you know we we have to tell her, hey, you can only read one book when you go to bed, and then you need to you need to turn out the light and go to sleep. So really enjoying that. That's great. Well, you know, my experience being homeschooled myself um, is is one that was very formative for me, of course. Um, but when I graduated from high school as a homeschooler, I had this choice of what would I do for a career and what I go to college to prepare for that. I chose not to go to college. Um, it so turned out that my mother ha had a publishing business that she had started that she owned. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I could go spend four years in college to get a degree and I could um, spend an awful lot of money and, and get a degree to go do a job that basically I could do without the degree. <laughs> right. So I thought, well, why would I want all that debt and four years of my life? And so I chose not to go to college, have never mm -hmm. missed it, have never mm -hmm. needed it, uh, have done really well in my life without a college experience. 
but what about you? Was that part of your career track as we're talking about future careers for our children? Um, was college part of your experience? Did you expect it to be? What, what was your uh, college dynamic like? Yeah, um, I, my parents did expect me to go to college. Um, and they really wanted me to go to a Christian college, and I did that. Um, I got a uh, undergraduate degree uh, in um, rhetoric, and then I went on and got a, a graduate degree, a master's in rhetoric as well. And uh, really thankful for that training. Um, it's it's been very helpful to me. Um, I've uh, you know I didn't really get any kind of career training that I use today, but there's a lot of principles that have shaped who I am and how I approach problems and um, how I study things. Um, so it's, it's been very helpful to me. And I notice it throughout my life that it has been a benefit. But there have been plenty of people who have uh, found um, that they, they already know how they want to be of service. And uh, they, they don't really need that college degree in order to do that. And uh, so that's, that's certainly something that, that works very well for a number of people. So when you, when you talk about rhetoric, obviously, along with that goes just the aspect of logic and critical thinking, mm -hmm. but then the ability to communicate and the ability to be able to expose fallacies and the ability to be able to uh, ideally be winsome in your presentation and you know, the ability to be able to communicate effectively uh, particularly in a world that doesn't necessarily agree with you or isn't inclined to. And so what, what you're talking about there is a preparation for how to think mm -hmm. more than how to build widgets or right. you know, how to do a, a particular task. It seems like much of the government educational system, uh, if you go back through its history, coming out of modernism and the industrial revolution and all that, it really was very much about career path, uh, particularly equipping students for the factory. Right. And, uh, you know, they, they kind of followed that whole industrial model of the assembly line approach of Henry uh, Ford with the, um, the, the automobiles and, and the, the industrial railroad and so forth. They, they basically took an, a very institutionalized approach to education to prepare people for particular uh, careers as employees. And um, the homeschool path is a little different than that. Um, and I would just say that the, the Christian philosophy, biblical philosophy of education path is a little different than that. Uh, and really, that's kind of a Marxist view, too, in a way, um, training people just for a career path. So I really feel that one of the aspects of a biblical education is that we are training the person for life. We're not mm -hmm. just training a person for a career. We're not just training them to be workers on an assembly line, but to really know how to think and how to problem solve and how to understand the world around them. Uh, that's really one of our goals. And, and I'm going to go off a little rabbit trail here, hopefully not too long, but just to say, I think now there's more of an emphasis within the government schools, uh, less emphasis on preparing you for a career, more emphasis on indoctrinating you into being mm -hmm. the right kind of citizen with the right politically correct socialist progressive agenda. Uh, right. That seems to be far more dominant than actually preparing you even for, for career skills. Um, but but let's let's use that kind of as a launching point, Ben, to, to talk about, uh, and as parents are seeking to prepare their children for careers, uh, what really, from a biblical worldview, what really is the difference between, say, that, it, that industrial revolution model of institutional schooling where we're preparing them to be good employees versus how, how would a biblical worldview be different than that? Well, I think, uh, first of all, one of the big differences between a biblical worldview and an industrial modernist view of man is that the biblical worldview views man as being the uh, the ruler of creation, and the industrial modernist view views man as a part of a system, uh, a system in which uh, we we contribute some value in order to produce more value for for the next person down the line, uh, and and there very much was kind of a, a machine type of uh, thinking, a systems sort of thinking 
from uh, the modernists, uh, particularly those who were um, developing the assembly lines and um, mass uh, manufacturing and so forth at that time. Um, so really, if we start back in Genesis, that forms up our view as people and our role in God's creation. And I think that has a tremendous impact, a huge impact on how we prepare our children for their careers, whatever God may be calling them into. Yeah, you know, it's another thing is just the whole dynamic of work. I think if you look at it from a humanistic standpoint, uh, people from a humanistic worldview tend to look at work as being a necessary evil, mm -hmm. where you go out and earn a paycheck so that you have money to basically live uh, in, in as much comfort and ease as you can afford. Right. And uh, work is something most people disdain, you know, the whole thank God it's Friday mm -hmm. campaign, right. you know, live for the weekend and all of that. Really, from a biblical worldview, we really need to teach our children a different philosophy of work. Don't right. We? Absolutely. Uh, work is a blessing. Um, that's what Genesis uh, 1, uh, 26 and following are talking about, is that um, that when God created man in his own image, he blessed him and uh, said to him, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion over it. And, and God immediately showed Adam what he meant by that, by assigning him some task. I want you to tend the garden. I want you to name the animals. You know, uh, we sometimes think about work as being part of the curse because work became more challenging at the curse. But really, Adam was working before the curse, and it was part of his blessing uh, that he was able to do that. And I think I think you're exactly right that that today in our culture, it's a very hedonistic view of of work. Um, you have some people who say, you know, get the best paying job you can so that you can enjoy life to its fullest. There's other people who say, well, find a, a career that's satisfying to you so that every day is satisfying to you. And it's kind of another path to that kind of enjoyment. And I think there's actually another uh, flaw in thinking that's, that's a little bit of secularism that creeps into um, Christianity uh, along this area of work. And it is that, you know, it, it'd be good if everybody was in ministry if everybody could be a pastor and a missionary, but not everybody can, and that's okay. So uh, you go work, and then you can tithe and give to missions. And, and that's the whole reason you work, is so that you can give uh, to those things. And that's really, that is uh, buying a little bit into secularism um, and saying that there is these things that are, uh, that, that are blessed and by God, and they're they're good things, and they're kind of in this upper story, and we go there, and that's that's good. And then you have the mundane things of earth, and it, God doesn't really have anything to do with those. Uh, so, you know, if you're if you're someone who's doing sanitary work, or you're someone who's in accounting, you know, that's that's okay, but it's not a high calling. And I think when we look in the Bible, that's that's not the view at all that the Lord gives us um, about that work. Uh, what he what he communicates to us is that if you are a sanitary worker and you're working hard uh, to help people exercise dominion in their homes, to have clean environment, to improve health, uh, you're you're doing what God. Uh, called people to do from the very beginning, and that is to exercise dominion over his creation. Yeah, I hear a little Francis Schaeffer influence there as you're, <laughs> you're describing that whole upper story, lower story. Um, uh, another phrase that we use for it sometimes is the sacred secular dichotomy. <laughs> right. I believe there's a, a sacred spirit of life, and then there's a secular spirit of life, but Jesus more or less doesn't have anything to do with that. Whereas the biblical view is that we're, we're integrated, uh, we're not separated as body and spirit, we're not separated mm -hmm. as sacred and secular, we are spiritual. And so what we do with our body really can be an act of worship and the work Absolutely. Do, um, is, is pleasing to the Lord and has merit within itself. Uh, and, and some of the Dutch theologians talked about that. They, they called it the, the cultural mandate, which was mm -hmm. uh, a bit broader than just the dominion mandate. Right. When we do this work. And, you know, I think Luther talked about that, that the, 
the way that the, the Christian shoemaker uh, makes a shoe to the glory of God is not by putting a Bible verse on it. It's right. By making a shoe, a quality shoe that will hold up and that people can afford. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really how you make shoes to the glory of God, you know, not merely trying to, to tack a Jesus verse onto something. And, and I, I think um, we're going to get to that maybe in a future broadcast uh, where we talk a little bit about the curriculum publisher that you work with, um, mm -hmm. University Press, BJU Press. Um, you know, there, that's the way a lot of people approach Christian education as well, is to basically take a secular framework mm -hmm. and stick some Bible verses in it and call that Christian. Like we've Christianized uh, education now because we've taken a humanistic worldview or approach to education and we threw some Bible verses on it. But what you're talking about is a complete integrated worldview the, uh, a functioning worldview of all of life that's mm -hmm. a game changer yeah i think it really is and uh i think that if if we change our whole posture toward work uh to align with what god describes what god actually blesses us with uh, then, it, then it has a totally different view on how we approach work and um, I think going back to the, the, the blessing that God has, because there's two parts of his blessing. We've been talking a little bit about the work, uh, but the other part is the be fruitful and multiply. Um, there's this idea in, in there that, um, that it is good and right that families are large and not just that families are large, but also that populations, communities, uh, the entire globe should be filled up with human beings. That's a blessing from God. And, uh, you know, it has been centuries that there have been humans who have said, you know what, if we keep having children, we're going to hit a population limit to the planet, and then we're all going to die. We're all going to die from starvation. And what we learn in the creation blessing is that there's this kind of connection between filling the world and having dominion over it. Because if all you had were your own two hands to feed your family and the entire world, the, the population could only get so big. But the more people exercise dominion over God's creation, ruling over oxen and sheep, uh, being able to rule the seas and pass through them, uh, being able to develop tools to help them do their work more efficiently, the more and more and more people we are actually able to serve. And um, that starts with a family, you know, and I think that we can start with our families right there. This is one of the reasons you're learning right now, because one day you're going to be leading a family. As a woman or a man, you are going to be doing work and it's good to be working and it's in service of your family. And um, that, is, that is a blessing from God. And then I think you can kind of like get, get your binoculars on and look at the big picture too, which is uh, when, when economies organize themselves organically according to creation, what happens is people start specializing. They start finding something they're really good at that they can use to serve the broader community. And the more that people do that, they're, they're not just part of a system, ser, uh, kind of serving the system, kind of like a communist system where bureaucrats are deciding where labor should go, but they're looking around them and seeing what human needs there are. And they go, I'm gonna solve that need. When they do that, they are exercising dominion in service of their neighbor and loving their neighbor. And that allows other humans to flourish, allowing, again, more and more and more uh, people to, to live in this planet, to fill it up more and more according to God's blessing. There's a fascinating documentary called Demographic Winter that talks about economically what happens to nations when they get below the 2.1 uh, mm -hmm. child per household threshold, which most nations have. You know, right. especially uh, Greece and you know, some of these nations that have just financially imploded, uh, Japan, right. uh, even Israel. You know, there's a lot of nations that have so bought into this uh, population myth 
that they're destroying their economy. And the U.S. Mm -hmm. is the only nation, I think, in, in the world whose uh, birth rate is 1.8, but that has population growth because of immigration. Immigration, so, right. So we're, we're not really doing our part on the birth rate side of it. But, mm -hmm. but basically, you get to a point where you have a not to go into too much economics, but, you know, you get to a point where you have this growing senior population mm -hmm. and there's not enough young people to take care of that senior population and there aren't enough people to drive the, the economic force of it. And so as much talk as people have about, oh, we're going to overpopulate the planet and all this, they're actually setting us up for economic failure right? by not encouraging families to do what God created them to do, which mm -hmm. was to procreate. Now with that, Let's just say that you, you get, you know, 8 billion people on the planet, but most of those people have a consumer mentality rather than a producer mentality because mm -hmm. they're not operating from within the biblical worldview. Then you have problems. You know, if you have a case where the majority of people within your country work for the government, right. that the government doesn't typically produce <laughs> anything. Right. You know, it takes producers to, to fund the government to, you know, do whatever it's doing, which is usually... Uh, you know, bureaucracy and red tape, right? Uh, th then that, you know, an, an economy can't be sustained that way. So, so one of the things that I try to teach my children on a practical level is just this difference between having a mentality of being a producer rather than being merely a consumer. We're all consumers to some extent, but um, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Just about how we teach our children that producer mentality, that, that dominion mandate mentality mm -hmm. against just you know, you want to get a job so that you can buy a new video game console, right? Buy a flat screen TV, you can, you know, buy entertainment, you know, you know what I mean? Go to sports games, right? I'm not, and, it's... and okay, hold up, hold up. I just, I just, <laughs> chamber here. Uh, I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong for, for people to participate to some extent in the consumer life. We all do right. to some mm -hmm. extent, but that's peripheral to the right. role of the Christian. It's not central. It is central to the life of most functioning humanists and Christians mm -hmm. who live like functioning humanists. That's right. Yeah, I, I think that uh, this is where the creation uh, blessing in Genesis 126 and following connects to the create or the, uh, the Christian ethic, mm. uh, which really our Christian ethic is summarized in two points. We need to love the Lord our God with our entire being. Mm -hmm. And we need to love our neighbor as ourself. Yes. And, and you hear the echoes of Genesis uh, yes. 126 and following in that. And that yes. first of all, we've been created in God's image. And second of all, we've, we've been created with this, uh, with this blessing of ruling over the world so that there can be human flourishing. And so if we live our lives loving other people, then we aren't looking at transactions, whether that's a production uh, transaction where I make something for you as transactional, as I do this for you and you do it for me. What, what the best way to arrange your life is, is how can I serve people? Yes. How can I, with the unique abilities and experiences God has given me in the past, serve the people around me the best? And when you live that life, you, you actually find uh, that, you know, finding a job's not difficult, holding a job's not difficult, uh, moving through your career's not difficult, because everyone's looking for someone who's going to help them meet their needs. That's so true. And, um, and, and there are more and more companies that are starting to realize this. There are companies that, that have tried to satisfy uh, shareholders by turning a good quarterly profit. And they're not really thinking about how they serve their customers. They're not really thinking about how they, they serve their communities. And, and there's starting to be a move to business where there, people are starting to say, hey, we really need to have a focus on our customers and how we serve them. And this is um, really a, a, re a return to Adam Smith because Adam Smith talked about this. Uh, for, for those who might not be familiar, Adam Smith is... Uh, you know, someone who wrote about capitalism, the visible hand, um, but he, he talked about the, the baker and, and why the baker does what he does. And uh, the baker is 
is doing things for his self-interest to make sure he's taken care of, but he's also doing it for the benefit of the person who walks into his bakery. And, uh, and, and the more the baker does that, bakes their best quality bread, so that they're the person who walks in and buys that bread, really enjoys it, that's the baker who's gonna have the repeat business. And um, if, we, if we teach our children to live that way, that I'm not studying math, I'm not studying history so that I can get rich. I'm not studying these things because I find them fun. I'm studying these things because my neighbor needs my service and I can serve them. And I just think about the, the Good Samaritan is a great example of this. Um, the, the Good Samaritan would not have been able to have been service to that man who fell among the thieves if his parents or someone hadn't taught him how to use um, the ointments that he used, uh, how, to, how to set someone's broken bones, how to care for uh, someone around him. He learned those things, he learned those skills, and then he was able to serve. And that's really how we wanna live our entire lives is with that kind of service mentality. And that, that really precludes uh, having a consumer mentality, which is a give me, give me, please me, please me sort of mentality. It's a serve others, serve others, meet their needs mentality. Well, that's great insights. And it makes me think of uh, Genesis 12 and Genesis 18 too, where God said, I've chosen Abraham, that through him and his descendants, that there would be a blessing to all the nations of the world. And in Galatians 3, how God talks about how that really is, is kind of a, a mandate that he's putting on us you know, and, and Jesus talked about the city set on a hill and being a mm -hmm. light that couldn't be hidden, uh, being salt that influences the culture. Uh, we really have that, that great opportunity, not just to love God, but to love our neighbor. And our family has a poster on our living room wall that says we exist to know, love and serve God and love and serve other people. And I think that's, Amen. that's what you're talking about. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we have run out of time already, oh, no. uh, but we were, we are going to have you back on another uh, future episode of the Family Renewal podcast. We'll talk again. And so um, just for quickly in closing, how can people get in touch with you if they want to invite you to speak at a homeschooling conference or uh, at an education conference or, or some other event uh, to come yeah. talk about Christian education? Yeah, well, uh, my email address is uh, B as in boy, T uh, as in Todd, that's my middle name, Davis at bjupress.com. And uh, if somebody is interested, they can uh, shoot me an email and I would love to hear from them to see how I can serve them. Well, I would encourage you strongly if you're looking for a speaker for an event, consider Ben. I've heard him speak. He's a great communicator. He is a guy who is a great thinker, and I think we are lacking that uh, in our day and time. And so I am grateful for uh, you joining us, and uh, we'll have you back on again. Thanks, Ben. Thank you.